Okay, well, we, let's get to our last presentation now. And uh, this presentation is by Amal Zugi of the National Institute of Science and Technology of the Sea in Tunisia, providing insight into the need for applying AI, uh, AI to meet the rising demands of seafood sustainability. Welcome again, Amal. Good morning. I am very glad to participate in this event today and share with you my knowledge. I am Amal Zouri, an engineer consultant in sustainable aquaculture using artificial intelligent tools. Today, I will present you briefly some examples about the use of AI tools in fish farming in Tunisia. Our work context, as you know, the demand for fish and other seafood is raising. It's essential we meet this need sustainably. For offshore cage, we need to produce fish in a way that protect our sea while feeding growing population. The way we manage our sea will determine our future. We believe that by making fish farming better, we can protect our strengthening that future for all. By making fish farming better, we can do it. My experience as fish farming technical manager, combined with my environmental background, has convinced me that farmers aspiring to be truly successful in aquaculture will need to be visibly sustainable. IIN data are the most credible way to share the evidence of this. We are working with many projects with many projects with the goal of helping Tunisian farmers reduce their environmental footprint. This will help the industry save billion kilograms of CO2 and innovation is the key. Feeding represents the biggest cost for fish farmers and the waste feed has the largest environmental impact. So optimization in this area will always be better and give better profitability. Feeding strategy use site conditions and biomass measures. So to reduce waste feed, feeding protocols depend directly on average weight of fish and appetite, as well as site conditions. So doing good sampling and correct sampling can help to follow correctly the growth. To follow the growth of the cage, the traditional sampling methods is often used. Sampling methods are different. A traditional sampling done with a deep net on the surface is less representative than that one done with a camera in the middle of the cage. Taking high quality digital stereo image of this live fish while swimming in the cage. So it's less representative using the traditional way. The principle is stereoscopic video image measures the height and the length of each fish while an algorithm accurately calculate the live weight of the fish. Intelligent software can easily provide detailed biomass report with an accurate size distribution graphic with a lot of measures and statistical parameters. With camera likes camera Vicas HD or camera Airmax algorithm or many others, we have an exactor biomass and subsequently a correct need which allow us to define a maximum ratio which will be exactly assimilated by the fish. And as a result, we reduce the feed losses and impact. We can mainly see difference between the minimum weight and the variation. Sorry. We can mainly see difference between the minimum weight and the variation CV in the second sampling. With the traditional sampling deep net, we take a lot of small fish that they always remain on the surface and the edges of the cage, but which do not represent the state of the entire population of the cage well. We can too, with this algorithm and uh, intelligent software, thus have the Airmax recommended feeding table. For example, for this case, should fish an average weight of around 370 gram at the start of August 2021. Or sure, respecting feed rate equal to Airmax and take in consideration the optimal general condition of the site. The potential of AI in aquaculture does not simply end with local farm economies. 
the system can provide the potential to power data driving insight into aiding the environmental and sustainability drives, sustainably drives. Uh, The potential of AI in aquaculture does not simply end with local farm economies. The system can provide the potential to power data driving instead into aiding the environmental and sustainably drives on this sector. The AI algorithm can measure the poor feeding that contributes to damaged floor bed and provides real time insight before this occurs. In the future, it's our aim to increase this sustainably efforts. Thank you for listening and I hope you all have a productive day. And if you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amel. Um, I think there's, in my mind, some very clear questions here of an overlap between fisheries and aquaculture. Um, we know that in the Pacific, for instance, they're dropping divers into the into the per se net to have a look at the type of fish that are there to decide whether they're going to pull those fish or not and, and i think these kind of systems that you've put together with the stereo cameras i'm just interested in how quickly the data can come back to is, is there any onboard analysis of these machines so that I mean, obviously, in, in an aquaculture net, you can afford to wait a few days to get the results. But what's the timeline between maybe doing the recording and then getting a, a result back for, for your manager? Because I can see this kind of opportunity being very handy, for example, for people working in purse same vessels who want to drop into a net that's closing and decide whether they want to pull those fish or release them. And, and equally, for if there was any particular critical species in there, instigating a, a mechanism to release those before they brought on brought the net on board thank you thank you for you too yes uh, we have we have a return back uh, quickly let's say quickly around uh, one hour after doing the uh, video but the problem is analyzing this uh, this video take uh, some hours uh, for doing uh, all the analyze uh, that we need the other problems are uh, the time that we need for many cages, because as you know, we don't have uh, only one cage to, to analyze each time. For farmers, we have uh, at least 10 uh, cage at minimum, and for Tunisian farmers, for example, in many farms, we have more than 60 cages. So taking a lot of time analyzing each one by one, one by one, and it takes a lot of time and we can improve a lot in this area. Um, Matt, would you have a question for Amel? Yes, I was just wondering um, what's, uh, what's it like integrating these systems uh, with the farmers? What, what's the, uh, the process and, and do they, what, what can you do to improve um, uh, the, the the, the farmer's opinion regarding using AI? We have to improve, uh, normally for, for me, we have to improve in three levels. These levels are the time analyzing the data after taking the video and the time taking the video too. The second level is uh, that uh, for, for the moment, this uh, kind of software uh, take, uh, uh, take image in good condition. And uh, we don't have all the time uh, whether good conditions in the site. Uh, and uh, the real conditions, we are a little bit far from the reality to help really the, the farmers. The second one is the prices of this, because in big farm, we, we, it's, not, uh, it's not possible to use only one software to take a lot of videos for all the cage at the same time and at the same day. So I think that uh, in these three levels, we need to improve a lot. And uh, for sure, it can help a lot for developing uh, sustainable aquaculture, for sure. Um, I know we've got, Amel, I know we've got another question for you. Um, this is from Anton Ellenbrook. Thanks, Anton. So. So sorry, hello. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. Well, thank you for it too. Yes, so Tunisia is not so far from Rome. We can see you. For sure. <laughs> uh, 
the, but this software is uh, often developed all, uh, for other species than the, the one you grow in uh, Tunisia. So, but yes. do we also work with uh, farms, for instance, in Greece or in Spain, where they may be already um, using this? And do you also work with the feeding industry? Because what you see, um, <laughs> the first slide was very good, where you say that most yes. of the costs are in feed. So a collaboration with feeding industry here yes, seems very obvious. Uh, for sure, we are working with others, but uh, to be honest, we start working with the, fee with the, the industry of uh, fish feed. They propose uh, to use this software to be sure about uh, the profitability of the project and the back, uh, the, the result uh, about this cage uh, to help us to improve the production and uh, to uh, improve the use of our feed. For example, we are working a lot with Italy because uh, for uh, the, uh, the feed is coming from 80% uh, from Italy to Tunisian farmers. And they are doing a good job for research and for helping us to improve the use of this kind of software. Okay. Thank you very much, Amel. Thank you for your okay, time. So we've, we've heard from our presenters today and we're gonna have a little bit of a round table discussion I just wanted to go through a little bit about what we've what we've seen today. So, for example, we started off with um, Millie as well as others talking about equity, and, and we've also spoken about the range of opportunities there are out there for doing this type of work. I mean, there is almost no end to when we start opening the box where we're we going with this opportunity. Um, we've spoken about how to build communities and how the United States has been very forward thinking through NOAA to be able to build this community, to come together um, and start to celebrate and, and, and help each other out in the kinds of ways that they're working. And we've seen the cross fertilization of different models that have been developed and such like. We've also seen the use of competitions to try and spur along the events and we've also heard about explainable AI, which is which is going to be a magnificent opportunity. I don't know exactly how that works for, for deep learning, but for machine learning, if we can start to pick up what is actually driving this, it allows for a much better iterative improvement. And, and we've just started to get an idea that it's not so hard to do if we can get the right people to share the right images and get the right backup to get those images tagged. But we've, we've started to realize that this whole procedure is allowing us to bring in more opportunities, more data sets together because machines can work in very quick time. And it allows us to shorten the time between collecting information and, and, and getting the outputs. And I think this is, this is a magnificent opportunity because everyone who works in science knows that sometimes when you bring a paper out, you're really publishing something that you did three, four years ago. And this is, this is nice, but in reality, if we're really going to grab the advances that are coming in this type of field, which are coming so quickly, both through technology and through the opportunities, it's going to be great if we can bring these stories alongside the fishermen who really see value in what we're doing. So in this session, we, we are going to ask the community of presenters to maybe throw in a little bit of their feeling, and then we're going to take you through to a little bit of a simulation about what type of themes came um, to the top of your mind. So if anyone from the panel would like to just give a bit of an idea of some of the messages they took from today or the, some of the surprises they took for from, from today or even some of the things that you know we, we might have missed out because there's obviously lots of areas that we think maybe should have been mentioned. Please just uh, go ahead and speak and I'll pin you to the, to the uh, to the open panel. Uh, it's Anthony from, from Kitware. I'm happy to start things off here. I, um, I think across the, the talks this morning, we saw a wide range of uh, maturity in the use of AI. Some people are really using it a lot and have been for years. Others are really just getting into it. and. In, forums and conferences uh, like this that, that we've been involved with at, at Kitware, uh, we often see that where there, there is this huge range of, um, of capability in AI by a particular uh, marine science group. 
And these meetings really serve to, to bring those new people in and expose them to what's possible and the tools that are available, uh, which is great. And this is how new people come to the Yami community, how they get into um, working with Microsoft or whoever else is, is helping out for their altruistic uh, aims. So I think that you know this, this workshop seems to be doing really well in that regard. Um, and I think that these meetings that might be their, their greatest purpose is, is to make sure that is to bring in lots more people who to see what's possible. And I hope I hope the folks who were hearing in the audience um, will will stay engaged and, and chat with with folks who have these capabilities and, and try things out because there is an active and burgeoning community. And it can be really intimidating to see what other people have done already and how far behind you might be. But I think uh, it's easy to, to try these things and um, I would urge people not to be intimidated and jump in with both feet. I think Scott and Christian bring the story a bit further along the, uh, the value chain. Scott specifically, you know, telling stories that are reaching the consumer and that, 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 that's a nice, a nice way to bring a, a much bigger audience to this discussion about how we produce our food and, and how we want to produce our food. So Scott, what, what was your take home after listening to some of the presentation? Well, thank you so much. And I, I just got so much out of all of your presentations. It's been really, really incredible to, to link up with you. I think what I took away from this is actually AI has captured imaginations across the world, obviously. And while it's an incredible tool for, for, for research, I don't, I also want to kind of underscore that I also from this presentation have seen it's just an incredible tool for science communication as well. Um, I think that the more that we can utilize these tools and these types of events to really showcase the work that's being done, the more you're likely to be able to captivate the imaginations of the public you're trying to communicate with and that you're trying to reach um, in order to effectuate the meaningful change in conservation and science that we seek to do. So, you know, I, obviously as a technical tool, what you're doing is, is, is extraordinarily valuable, but I also want to just underscore that it has immense value outside of just the scientific community and into the um, to just the public's imagination. So again, thanks for the opportunity to participate. Yeah, I remember if you're really as old as me, you recognize that in the early days when you went to your boss and said, I want a computer, they would go, no, no, we just don't have budget for that. But now everyone's got computers. In fact, they've got more than one computer and no one questions the fact that that's a piece of kit that is you know, basic to your business if you're in our business. And, and I'm just wondering if the stories that we tell are, are really about capturing people's imagination so that there is, because to be honest, it's, it's money that makes these things happen. Ingenuity is there throughout the world. But when you put money with ingenuity and with keen people, you, really things start to happen. And this is where, you know, theming up the story for what needs to be done where and what need, what's been left out of these these uh, developments, which will help to bring the, the whole together is something that's very important for us. So I don't know if anyone's got any examples there of how the stories changed the way that their departments have looked at the questions that they're dealing on. I mean, Amel spoke about how the feed operators have played a role to help her industry work on these questions. I mean, what's coming through the door that's making it useful? Threatened species, for example, is another one. So for me, for example, um, I want to share with you the idea that aquaculture is to try to be helpful and to be sustainable for uh, for the environment and using the software help a lot. And uh, you can believe how much we can uh, help this industry to develop uh, the activity uh, with a lot of sustainable efforts. And uh, it's so important uh, that uh, many companies develop uh, machine learning algorithms uh, because our work can be 
faster and uh, efficient more uh, and uh, we can uh, obtain a lot of good results uh, helping the industry of aquacultures too. So um, I am very, very happy today to participate in this event. Thank you uh, for all the team that organized this work. And uh, I think that uh, the future is uh, AI and machine learning uh, algorithms. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. I've got to pose a question to Matt. Matt with Kitware. You, you've got such an incredible range of work on your system, how are you going to how are you going to partition that? For example, if we're going to put together proposals to bring the international community, we have to theme that story because giving a very complex story to funding bodies is is very hard to to work with. What's your feeling about the key themes that that need the efforts at an international scale? Obviously, small groups have all their own needs, but what, at an international scale, what are the key themes in your mind? I guess my comments there would be that some approaches are very general. Um, so there are lots of commonalities across the board in, in what people are doing, things like trawling pipelines um, that might be able to be standardized a bit more. Um, so some approaches are very wide ranging in that they can be applied to a wide range of problems and you might not need to reproduce the wheel at every level. Um, but then you have the opposite side of that where people are also doing very specialized things like um, you know, invoking thermal cameras as opposed to optical and then like triggering optical detections and running those in certain circumstances. Um, you know, different types of specialized sensors like, um, you know, going beyond stereo, but like using stereo and acoustics for measurement and some of these other problems um, might require very specialized solutions. Um, so you really have the duality where you have some problems um, that I think can be solved pretty generally, um, but then others that are, are more specialized. Um, I think a few people pointed this out, but the algorithms aren't perfect yet. Um, Sure, things are advancing very quickly, and, and I expect they'll continue to over the uh, the next five years at a rapid pace. Um, but you know, things still aren't perfect, and when you have multi-million-dollar industries, um, you know, getting things there and, and boosting your accuracy will definitely be important over the next few years. To tail on that, I think the, the higher the higher level international picture, if I'm going to take this to, to funding agencies, UN, et cetera, is that. Um, that AI can be used really effectively by, by scientists without knowing anything about AI. And that, that's pretty new over the last year or two or three. And that's Viami's mission is to enable non-scientists to, to use deep learning and take advantage of all of that without knowing or caring how it really works and without doing any programming. So often if you didn't know, need to know how AI worked, but you had to be a programmer to make it work. And now with Miami and other tools, you don't have to have that. You, mean, you label some data, you use interfaces, you try stuff out, it doesn't work. You label some more data, you can try other things. And you don't need to be a computer scientist to make this stuff work for you on these specific problems. And I think that's been a real turning point uh, for Miami and for the community like this at large and other scientific communities that AI can now be leveraged and adapted in the field by scientists. You don't have to have a some PhD in the back room solving your problem and then rolling it out to you. A different problem, you got to go back to that PhD again. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you can get the tool and you don't need that expert help. So that enables AI to be used really widely. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I just wanted to allow you to the fact that one of the things we have put in the past to try and develop a collaborative project around some of the work that we've been doing with the beta projects. But these have been small apps around threatened species, mainly sharks and rays. And I think there's an opportunity now to, to, to look more broadly. And I know there's an EU Horizon Infra 2021 call, for example, that has to be written by September, 21, uh, September this year. And its focus for this big investment is better use of imaging data. So it speaks very much to the work that we're doing. And what, what I'd like to do is add something to the chat now. And it speaks very much to what Matt was just saying. You know, what are the key questions, even if they're small or big? And if you don't mind diving over to this, this is a, just a virtual whiteboard where all you need to do is put your name in and you should be given access. 
And I'd love people to just add what they think are the big questions. And to add anything to this virtual whiteboard, you just double click on a free space under themes, for example. After you've double spaced, you add some text and then you click out. And you can see I've just done that, which leaves a message. And what I'd like you to do is just add a theme, which you think is the kind of theme that you think should be in such an application, the kind of theme which tells a story to uh, funding bodies, but also allows it to capture a, a group of work which might be useful for collaboration on an international level. And then if you have something very fine scale, just add it to the task. So all you really need to do is double click on a blue spot, type in there, click out and it will leave your message behind. And it's just a way of putting ideas up and you can see there's other ideas there. And we will use this page to help us to structure what we're trying to consider to try and get more funding for this kind of opportunity for people to collaborate. Um, Anton and Matt, would you like to speak at all to this uh, discussion? I was expecting Matt to go first. Ah, okay, sorry. I was just answering a question in the Q&A. Um, yeah, I think um, there's, a, there's actually a really important uh, question that's been posed in the Q&A that I'd like to highlight. Um, there's two actually, uh, and one is about uh, data standardization. Did you, did you see that, Anton? Um, I saw it, yes. Yeah, one topic I, I didn't hear much about is about how to make your data AI ready, standard best practices, etc. It'd be nice to hear some discussion on this. And I think from FAO's positioning in terms of data collection, that's quite an important point. But the other one um, posed by the same person actually uh, is um, a key to our development in, in, in NOAA is the partnership we are building with the industry, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, um, AWS, etc. How can other countries take full advantage if, of all of this? Can FAO take this responsibility to bring a platform to enable sharing knowledge and opportunities to partners, etc.? So, in the form of a bridging fun function, uh, and I think that's a real key point, um, and the, one of the, the reasons why we, we've brought everybody together, really, isn't it, Tim? Anton, yeah. Maybe uh, also Hassan can say a few things. So he um, asked already, so how do you prepare your data to make them AI ready? I think on, um, on things as standards and best practices, I think that is really what this uh, whole conference was about. So how do we start to develop these uh, standards for an international community? So not only for a, um, a universal research center in Europe or the US, but how do we make this then accessible for also for people in, uh, for instance, around the Mediterranean. I think the, the question that Hassan poses here has maybe to do also with uh, metadata, not only on the image itself or on the, the streaming media that you get, but also on who will be able to access it, what will be the attribution to the people that brought the data to a platform. So if you think you can work with a big fishing community, what is the incentive for these uh, fisher fishers to contribute to data. I think that is a needed discussion that FEO will have to have, and also one of the reasons we organized it. And then on partnerships, yes, FEO is in a partnership already, in a lot of partnerships, also with private industry. And I think also there, the, the idea of a partnership with the UN organization is to uh, make sure that other people know about these initiatives and, and find a way to also connect to maybe private industry, but through a UN body, so to, to, we can help them to take the first steps and to feel more secure in taking the first steps. If you are a, a country with a, a reasonably good fisheries um, monitoring or a control program, or if you have an environmental uh, protection agency that wants to know what the benefits are, I think it's difficult for a lot of countries to step directly to a a big uh, private industry and, and ask them for help or assistance. So the, these countries, I think they first want to knock on FAO's door. So if we have these partnerships, and we do have a few, 
we can help uh, these countries to really reach out and to learn about first, learn about what is uh, possible with AI, but then also maybe help them to take the first steps in AI driven analysis of uh, environmental fisheries, uh, social economic problems. Yeah, I think that's a very important um, point that you bring up there, Anton, because in reality, FAO is not really an organization by itself. It's actually just an amalgamation of the world's governments instructing a small body to help those governments orientate themselves around questions which need international collaboration. So points that Anton was speaking about there regarding coming together and making a, some type of guidance for countries on what type of not necessarily controls or rules, but what kind of standards would they promote? And getting those kinds of relationships ironed out so that we do get that sharing happening with people feeling safe in the room and also for the less advantage to uh, not be left out. So that's going to be a very important question for us going forward. And there's some places where, you know, the, the kind of international arm maybe doesn't need to be so focused. There's going to be very, very small use cases which are worked on in private that maybe don't need to be shared. And so there's that mix of things that people have to talk around and there's things that potentially can tell stories or allow transferring outside of this kind of international collaboration. 